Hello, and I'd like to welcome you to the Pear Archery Seminar put on by World Archery Asia. My name is Megan Tierney. I'm a World Archery International Judge, and I'm also a World Archery International Classifier. I'm the liaison between the judges, para committee, and the classification committees, and I've also been teaching para archery to both international classifiers and international judges. Today, we're going to understand the basics of classification and what an athlete needs to do to get classified. We'll understand assistive devices and the limitations there are on them. We'll know the differences between para archery rules and able-bodied rules, and we'll have a basic understanding of visually impaired archery. So the purpose of classification is to level the playing field so there is equity among the different types of disabilities. The first thing an athlete needs to do is to fill out a medical intake form. They're found on the World Archery website under the Para Archery classification page. They must be completed in English and they must be typed. Handwritten is not accepted. They must be turned in 30 days prior to a tournament so that it can be evaluated. The head classifier then determines if there's an eligible impairment and once the MIF or the medical intake form is accepted, an appointment is set up for classification prior to the tournament. So what to expect during classification is that a panel of two international classifiers or one international classifier and an international classifier candidate will perform a functional assessment based on the eligible impairment on the medical intake form. So some of the medical impairments, they're determined by the International Para Classification Committee and they are decreased range of motion, decreased muscle power, ataxia and hypertonia which are both times types of abnormal muscle tone, loss or deficiency of limb. For the arm it has to be above the wrist, for the leg it has to be above the ankle, and then visual impairment. So testing could include range of motion if, there's, if that's what their limitation is, or muscle testing, or we could be testing their abnormal muscle tone. Then a class is assigned, a status is assigned, and any assistive devices they are allowed to use to level the playing field is assigned. And then finally, an on-field observation is conducted to make sure what we see on the field is what we saw in the classification room. So the classes are W1. They're a wheelchair archer and they have functional impairments in three of their limbs and their trunk. They may shoot a compound or a recurve bow, and they have specific rules on their bows. A WT is a wheelchair archer whose upper body is pretty much intact, and they compete in the open division with the standing archers. The standing archer competes in the open division with the W2s. They can shoot a recurve or a compound bow. They have limitations in either an arm or a leg. And they may be allowed a stool, which will be listed on the classification card. You also have a non-eligible class, and they're not eligible to shoot as a para-archer. We're not saying they don't have a disability. We're just saying they don't have enough points or a, enough of a loss to compete as a para-archer. And then we have the visually impaired categories. We have B1, B2, B3, and that's from the International Blind Sporting Association. That's where you get the Bs from, but their divisions are VI1 and then VI1 and 2 shoot together. 2 and 3 shoot together, excuse me. So the non-eligibles have insufficient points. They get an automatic reevaluation at the next available opportunities. If the second panel agrees, then they're non-eligible and it's confirmed. And if the second panel disagrees, it requires a third panel and the majority of whether or not they believe this person is non-eligible is what is final. 
So W1, men, they have the men's divisions, the women's divisions, they have doubles, which is two men, and they have mixed teams, open W2 and standing combined. They have the men's division, the women's, they have doubles, which will be two men, or they have um, mixed teams, which is a man and a woman shooting the same type of bow. Then we have the visually impaired. We have W1s, um, excuse me, VI1s who all shoot together, and VI2 and VI3 shoot in the same division. So here's a classification card. This is what they look like. This is the front of it. This is all that's important. So number one, we'll show the athlete's photo. It helps the judges to identify them. Number two is their class. That will be the W1, W2, standing, or it will be B1, B2, B3. Then their class, their status, which will be confirmed, review, or review with the fixed date. Number four is their assistive devices. 4A will be a picture if there's an unusual device that, um, for example, uh, a release aid system, there might be a picture of it on there um, to help the judges to know what the athlete is allowed to use. And number five will be comments. Under the comments, there might be things such as um, they're allowed to have their seat back higher than the normal amount that is in the rules, or if they're allowed to um, use a certain device because they have poor balance that normally they're not allowed to use. There will be comments in there from the classifiers for the judges to understand what they are and are not allowed to do. So now we get to status. You have the confirmed status which is unlikely to change. This is people who have had like a spinal cord injury for over two years, somebody who has an amputation or a loss of limb, that's not going to change. The review status is for previously classified athletes that have a condition that is no longer eligible. So for example, leg length deficiency used to be an eligible condition. It is no longer accepted. So they had to be reclassified. Um, also, if the International Paralympic Committee changes the, the International Paralympic um, Classification Code, then sometimes we need to reclassify people. Review with the status, with a fixed date, is for conditions that might change. For example, if someone has had a head injury less than two years ago, it might change in two years. Or if somebody has something like multiple sclerosis, which changes, they might need to be reclassified again within whatever date is on there. What's important to remember is whatever date is on there, you must be classified before that date or you're not allowed to compete as a para-archer. So for example, if your fixed review date is in the middle of a tournament, if you are not classified before the tournament, you cannot compete in this tournament. So now we're going to talk about assistive devices. Assistive devices can only be used to match the level of impairment, and we're not allowed to give an assistive device that will enhance performance. What's not on the card is as important as what is on it. If it's not listed on the card, the athlete is not allowed to use it. The exception is lower limb prosthetics or lower leg braces, which are not regulated by world archery. So if you look on the classification card, here is a list of what you might see on the classification card. You'll probably see two or three of these, maybe just one that says wheelchair, or maybe nothing at all if they're a standing archer and have no balance issues, there'll be no assistive devices listed. So for a wheelchair, it's a standard wheelchair with three or four wheels touching the ground. A motorized fifth wheel can be used to get on and off the field. However, once they're on the shooting line, that fifth wheel must come off. For power wheelchairs, they're fully acceptable as long as they're within that 1.25 meters that there is the regulation. Only four wheels may touch the ground. And once they're on the line, they should be turned off 
and they need to be sitting in an upright position. If you look at the wheelchair on the left, it's perfectly acceptable. And on the right, there are six wheels on this one, so this would not be acceptable. On a wheelchair, anti-tippers are allowed, but they should not be touching the ground. They are there for safety, and they are not mentioned in the rules, but they are allowed. The wheelchair shall not exceed 1.25 meters in length, including the feet of the athletes. So whatever is sticking out farthest in the front and whatever is sticking out farthest in the back is what the judges will measure. So the feet and usually the back wheel is what they will be measuring. The highest part of a wheelchair that an athlete can lean on needs to be 110 millimeters below their armpit. So if you look at this picture, the red line shows below the armpit and the highest part of this chair that the athlete can lean on is the push handles. So that's where that 110 millimeters needs to be. Here's a picture of a judge measuring that 110. If you look, they're going right up into their armpit with their judge's notebook. And then the highest part of this chair is the back of their chair. So that's where they're measuring from. If you look at this picture on the left here, the push handles are not attached to the back of the wheelchair, so the athlete cannot lean against them. So you would measure the height of the back of the chair for this athlete. Picture on the right is a little bit more clear. There is no way an athlete can lean against those push handles. So even though they're much higher than that 110 millimeters, we would measure from the back of the chair on this particular athlete. Lateral support is any support to the side of the body above the pelvis. It can be a protrusion, a molded back support, or the uprights of the chair. So lateral support helps to control the side-to-side -side movement of an athlete. And the bylaw states that any wheelchair archer may use lateral support as long as it is half the width of the athlete's body and 110 millimeters below the athlete's armpit. It is no longer listed on the classification card. If you use a wheelchair, you're allowed to have lateral support. This, is, this came into effect in March of this year. So how do we measure this? The width of an archer's trunk is measured from the base of the sternum or the breastbone to the back of the athlete. So you get your fingers on those, or Imagine where those two points are and draw up an imaginary line between there. And as long as the lateral support is not in front of that line, it's perfectly legal. If you look at the picture, there's the base of his sternum, there's his back, dropped a yellow line there, and you can see that his lateral support is nowhere near half his body width. So it's perfectly legal what he's doing here. In this picture, Lateral support talks about above the pelvis. In this picture, all her lateral support, all this support on the side is below her pelvis. So it doesn't matter how far forward it goes. This is perfectly legal what she has here. As long as it's below the pelvis or you know, the hip bones, it's perfectly legal. It's about the level of the waist. So anything above the ribs is considered lateral support. Here's a picture of a molded seat back, and if I were to measure between the base of the sternum and his back, drop a line down, he's just within the limits, and I would allow this as an international judge. Here on the side, he's using the metal uprights of his chair, but he can lean against them, so they do count as lateral support. But again, it's only half his body width, so it's perfectly legal in this picture. These are what are called protrusions. And if you look at this athlete, it goes well beyond half his body width. So this would not be considered legal to use in shooting. However, what the athlete did was he opened it up so that he cannot lean against it. He can lean against this metal piece, but it's only within half his body width. So it's perfectly legal.
Strapping will be listed on the classification card if an athlete is allowed to use it. Prior to March 2022, you had to have um, an okay to use either strapping or lateral support, but now that everybody can use lateral support, if you have strapping slash lateral support that was given before March of 2022, you are still allowed to use your strapping. W1s are allowed to use any amount of strapping if it's listed on their classification card, and W2s have limitations. It can only be five centimeters wide, it can be wound horizontally once around their trunk, and it needs to be 110 millimeters below the armpit. So for W1s, it has to be on the classification card. It can be any amount of body support or strapping, and as long as it doesn't give support to the bow arm while they're shooting. So if you look at the athlete on the left, she has, it's much wider than the five centimeters, and that's okay. The athlete on the right, his is crisscrossed, it's perfectly fine. W2s have limitations on their strapping, and it does need to be on their classification card. It can only be five centimeters wide, it can be wound around once horizontally, and it must be at 110 millimeters below their armpit. If you look at the top athlete, he has perfect strapping. It's just perfect. If you look at the athlete down below, he has bumped his uh, strapping up in the front, and if I were judging that tournament, I would measure to make sure it was still that 110. He might need to pull that strapping down again. Leg strapping will be listed on the classification card, and it again, it's limited to that five centimeters. Athletes are allowed to have anti-rollers on their wheelchair, and it um, keeps the chair from rolling backwards when they stand up. And there was a 2012 interpretation which allow, allows them to use external, they're called chalks, um, to stop the wheelchair from rolling back. That's perfectly legal. An athlete may use a standing athlete may use a stool if it is listed on their classification card. It cannot have a backrest of any kind. It cannot support the bow arm in any way. And the area of contact with the ground with the athlete sitting on it must fit within the 1.25 meters of their lane width at a para event. Release aid systems, it's a simple system that allows an archer to use a legal release and it's based on the functional deficit of the athlete. So this is where you will see a picture on the front of a classification card if they have an unusual release aid system. But keep in mind the release itself must follow world archery rules. Here are some pictures of release aid systems. Um, some use their chin to release, some use their mouth, some use tension to use as their release. All of these are perfectly legal. However, a release aid system cannot function as a form of lateral support. Again, that's that side to side movement. So as long as the whole system is above the ribs, it is perfectly legal. It also can only wrap around three quarters of the body. I have a picture of that in a little bit. If you look at this picture on the left, his is way up into his ribs. It's perfectly legal. If you look at the one on the right, hers drops down to her pelvis, so then it will control how much side bending she has. This is not legal because it's considered a lateral support. Here's a picture of what you're allowed to use can go around three quarters of the body. So one quarter of the body cannot have any rigid form on the release aid system. Um, the picture on the right just shows how the strapping, and this, again, the strapping needs to be non-rigid so that there's some movement in there. Mouth tabs are not considered a release aid, and they're the only thing a recurve Archer may use in the open class if they need one. It will not be listed on the classification card because any pair of archer can use a mouth, mouth tab provided it is permanently attached to the string. 
bow arm bandage is for para archers who need help with their hand holding their bow because they have a loss of strength. It cannot be rigid, it cannot be fixed. And there has to be a little bit of movement within that system and it also cannot fix their wrist. There has to be movement there also. A bow arm aid is for athletes who have lost their arm. These are attached to the bow, but again, they cannot be rigidly fixed to the bow and there has to be some movement between the bow and the bow arm aid. So it could be a prosthesis, it could be a hand, it could be um, in the upper right, um, the gentleman is using PVC piping and he had it attached so that it didn't move. We talked about it, he loosened it up, so there was play in there, so then it became perfectly legal. A bow arm splint is for uh, pair archers who have a bow arm disability and it can be non-rigid, which means it can't be hard plastic and it can't be metal. There has to be some play, it has to have some movement within it. And it must be described on the classification card. For the string arm, they can also have a splint on their wrist if it's on the classification card. Um, again, it has to have some movement in it and some archers have their release attached to it. A block is for athletes with a leg-leg difference. So they may use a platform to even out the ground for themselves or it may be built into their shoe. If you look at the picture of the sneaker, it has a built up uh, sole on it. There is a limitation if you're using a block, it can only have two centimeters around the outside of the shoe itself. This does not have to be on the classification card. Anybody can use one of these if they want to, but they almost follow that two centimeter rule outside of the shoe. Athletes with a tight heel cord may also use a wedge. And again, this does not have to be on the classification card. W1 are standing class pair archers with severe upper limb disability who are unable to safely or efficiently knock their arrows or adjust their sights may have an assistant put on their classification card. The assistant may not disturb other athletes while they're on the line and they must wear the same uniform and the same number as the athlete. And the assistant should assist during qualification and during match play. At this time, during match play, an archer may have an assistant and a coach with them in the box. An agent is different than an assistant. Anybody can have an agent. They go up and they do your scoring, the athlete scoring, and they pull their arrows. It does not need to be on the classification card, and it's the responsibility of the archer to have their own agent. There's an assistive device document user guide, and it's for judges, classifiers, coaches, athletes, and others to assist in understanding the reasons behind the rules related to assistive devices and with interpreting them when considering the use of a new and unique pieces of equipment. You'll find it on the extranet of World Archery. It's uh, listed under para. There's pictures, so it's good. So there are specific rules for W1 equipment. They're the same equipment rules as World Archery with the following exceptions for the W1 class. The peak draw weight is 45 pounds. No peep sights or scope sights are allowed. A level device is not allowed. A release aids are permitted if they're on the classification card. And either a lip or a nose marker is allowed. Both straps and body support are allowed. And the back height of the wheelchair may be less than 110 millimeters if it is on the comment section of the classification card. An assistant will be listed on the classification card. Okay, now we're going to talk about para-specific rules. So for electronics on the line, the para and judges committee agreed that archers that are sitting in their wheelchair and remain on the shooting line at all times should be allowed to use devices 
like tablets or cell phones for to read or access social media during the scoring breaks but not while shooting is in progress for any archers in the competition. The reason for this is like any electronics on the line, they don't want to have any coaching happening during shooting. So during scoring breaks, they are allowed to use electronics. During the qualification rounds at pair events, athletes are allowed 1.25 meters of space, W1 shoot from 50 meters at a full 10 ring, 80 centimeter target face, compound open, shoot at 50 meters, recurve, open shoot at 70 meters, and archers may stay on the shooting line between ends. Doubles rounds, which has replaced team rounds so that we're able to get more women into shooting para archery. All archers remain on the shooting line so the archers must raise the arm when they are finished. Only then may the next archer remove the arrow from their quiver. It's the same idea as an archer in able-bodied events, going back behind the one meter line and before the other one can move forward. If arm raising is not possible due to um, a physical problem, then they have to arrange with the judge another single signal, excuse me. So most of the times I see a pair of archers raising their hand and saying go at the same time. And then the next archer is allowed to pull the arrow from their quiver. W1 doubles and mixed teams are shot on a full 10 zone 80 centimeter target face. And the mixed teams is made up of one woman and one man in the same boat type. Elimination rounds are the same format as able-bodied eliminations. W1 athletes use cumulative scoring for five ends and recurve athletes use the set system. The same rules as able-bodied event except for the following. Athletes may stay on the line during individual and double rounds. And during a pair event, 30 seconds will be allowed for a pair archer to shoot their one arrow during match play with alternating shooting. So let's move right into visually impaired archery. These are the classifications that you will see on the classification card. They're based on visual acuity, how well they see. So B1s are the athletes that have the least amount of vision. Then you have B2 and B3. So the divisions, the V1, VI1 athlete have their own division. The VI2 and VI3 athlete are combined and shoot together. Men and women shoot against each other in their respective divisions. And if there are not enough athletes, in each division, then VI1 is combined with the VI23 category, and all athletes must wear a mask. So their equipment, the VI1 athlete must wear a mask at all times during the tournament from the moment they step onto the field until the tournament is concluded. And it can be a sleep mask, it can be a wraparound mask, or it can be goggles. The judges will check the equipment during inspection and at any time they may recheck, recheck it. And the reason that the VI ones have to use it is some VI athletes are completely blind, they see nothing, and some actually have a light perception. So they want to make it a level playing field so everybody wears a mask. All athletes must use a tactile site and no other site is allowed. There is a size limitation to the tactile site. It can be two centimeters in any direction and shall only contact with the back of the hand or the forearm. Here's a picture of one on the right. The tactile site is mounted on a stand which normally includes foot locators. The foot locators that's in contact with the athlete shall not be more than six centimeters and the total width of the stand shall not be more than 80 centimeters. 
They can use either a recurve or a compound bow, but the peak draw weight is limited to 45 pounds. So they have what is called a spotter. Any VI athlete can have a spotter. They may sit or stand one meter behind the shooting line. They may only adjust the sight between practice or scoring ends. They cannot adjust at any time during the tournament, just between ends. And they shall not disturb the other athletes during shooting. The VI 30 meter round consists of 72 arrows shot on an 80 centimeter face. The VI Olympic round is shot at 30 meters on the 80 centimeter target face. And target allocation shall be arranged so that the athletes do not have to move targets, even if it means that their opponent is not shooting on adjacent targets. What is starting to happen at VI um, competitions is they'll put colored markers on the two athletes that are shooting against each other so that people are aware of who is shooting against whom during, during matches of elimination. So this is the end of the presentation. I hope you've learned something today and I'd like to thank World Archery Asia again for inviting me to come. My name is Megan Tierney and thank you very much.